Hurt Your Sides Laughing with Better Buddies. Hello, and welcome back to Better Buddies. I'm your host, RJ, and with us this week, it's John. Hello. Uh, and James. Hello. Our Better Buddies icebreaker this week, when cooking a frozen pizza, do you put it straight in the oven or use a pizza tray? Straight up. Pizza, Ooh. meats, great. Does the cardboard count? The, what the uh, fuck you, is you wrong with you? You put the cardboard in the oven? Yeah, I'll leave the cardboard on. You can tell me. What? No! Uh, Don't put the flammable not? object that in the oven! That is a fire hazard. <laughs> can you not do that? If you want to start a fire. Oh, wait, no. I don't put the cardboard in the oven. I uh, I do. I take it out with Hang the cardboard. Hang on, stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, asked yeah. the question, when cooking a frozen pizza, do you put it straight in the oven? And you went, okay, yeah, no, I'd use the cardboard. <laughs> he does. No. He does put it straight in the oven. Cardboard I do. Included. Leave some yes. plastic wrap on, too. <laughs> yeah, I do. Hey, that's actually where most of the nutrients are in pizza. I don't know if you knew that. Um, I didn't know that, no, and I still don't. I I would use... I, I, I'll i use a, a pizza tray, usually. Um, yeah, because that way, just in case anything melts or whatever, you know? That is true. I used to be a straight-into-the-oven person, and then... How did, how did my, oh, right. Uncivilized. I, for whatever reason, I don't know why I bought it, because I never <laughs> used one before. But I was like, huh, I have a new apartment a year and a half ago. And I was like, ah, oh, I should get a pizza tray. And I got a pizza tray, and I never looked back. It changed his life. It really um, didn't. And in fact, I don't <laughs> know if I necessarily like it more, because I don't feel like the pizza gets as crispy. There is something to be said about a pizza just absolutely disintegrating and falling through your oven, though. Like, true. That don't happen with a pizza tray. This is true. And this is true. Those Although, weird, like edge, like hanging off bits that make it hard to get off the rack. Yeah, I will true. say though, like I've done it straight on, and it do- it is a little crispier, which is nice. I also make like one frozen pizza a year at this point, so I guess I don't really have much of a you can open pizza preference. game. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really well, can we at least can we also admit that they design those things evilly? Like like they are too like small to eat like uh I'm trying to think of how to say this. Too small to share, but too much for one person. Yeah, and it's like by the time you have like a couple pieces, you're basically like most not most of the way through it, but like you're like you well, have two I, pieces I don't know. and you're a quarter of the way through it. Like yeah, at that point like, like, you might as well work. have half of it. <laughs> yeah, and, then and at that once point, you're half of it, you, the rest. you really could just finish it. Oh, I, I always my lesson. I always eat a f- I always eat a frozen pizza in like a day or two, like if not a sitting. But that might just be my poor discipline. So, well, no, that's fine. I mean, it doesn't keep very long either. Yeah, no, so it, a day on. or two is totally fine. You should really not have like leftover frozen pizza for more than a day or two. Oh, really? <laughs> How long do you keep frozen pizza for leftovers for? Uh, I mean. I mean, it's I not could bad see... for you to keep them for longer. It's just like, why would you? Like, if you make other things or you might even forget about it, like, you know, I could see a few days. I could see, like, How if you make it on Monday. Fridge? Not, like, super full, but yeah. I also, I'm... Oh, uh, I, have like, a, I have a follow-up question on that, but please continue. Yeah, I mean, I could still see if you're still, like, if you have other things in frozen pizza, like... You might just go and make other things. I could easily see if you make a frozen pizza on Monday, you still having stuff by Friday. Maybe I'm the weird one because I have the option to eat at home for like lunches. That that is life. I do too. Yeah. What was your follow up um, question, John? 
what's the roommate situation like in the fridge? Do you all have your own area? Do you like how does that work? It's natural. It settles itself. You know what I mean? Like, um, I think everybody. It's more of like there are general areas that are clearly like this is where some of the vegetables are going to go and the meats and like then this is where the condiments or the things go. Like everybody does a really good job of respecting each other's kind of like space. I feel like in the fridge, um, it's more the areas and where the food goes themselves rather than like this is my area and this is yours. You know. Gotcha. But do you still only eat your food? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I never eat. I never <laughs> eat my roommate's food. No. You've grown. I have. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> hey, twenty eighteen James was a different breed <laughs> of man. That. Now yes. I just distinctly remember an episode of you like walking into my house or somebody's house and just grabbing a pop tart out of the pantry. I, re- I distinctly remember being at <laughs> John's house. It always came up that it was like, I remember yeah, that. you just walked into John's house and grabbed a pop tart out of the pantry without asking or anything, dude. And it I, was like, I, I mean, sure, can't blame you. But we like would have also, said yes, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I wouldn't have done that at anybody else's house, because, like, is that the last (laughs) Pop-Tart? I mean, it's definitely embarrassing. I just, like, dude, we never, we never, like, I don't know if my, my parents might have bought Pop-Tarts, like, once. You know what I mean? Like, they were, like, when I was a kid, those things were, like, Turkish delights. Delicacy, yeah. James would have sold out his family for one single pop tart. <laughs> I would have definitely sold out my dignity, which I did consistently for pop tarts. So yes, dude, pop tarts are so fucking good. They're basically just cookies for breakfast. They're I mean, really that's not really that what good. I I'm not, gonna stand I'll, on this one. No, I'll fight. No, I'll fight you I on that. I ate pop tarts for like. A, t- a year sh- or two straight for breakfast, yeah. like every morning would have a pop tart. They're fine. Don't get me wrong. They're fine, but they're not that good. You no. just gotta shift over to the adult pop tarts, like cinnamon sugar. And That's what I was eating. Grape. I was eating cinnamon, like brown cinnamon sugar pop tarts were my favorite. I ate those consistently, and it was just kind of like they work. They're good enough, but, like, if I had a choice between a Pop-Tart and a frozen waffle or a Pop-Tart and a toaster pastry, I'm going to pick the frozen option every time. Dude, I think I think the thing is, is, like, like the Pop-Tarts, like, they're supposed to be more of, I think, like, a delicacy, and you're supposed to get the flavor. Like, those are a great Saturday morning, like, I'm going to sit down and play video games or, like, watch cartoons or... You're telling me you're going to sit down on a Saturday morning to play video games or watch cartoons, and you'd rather have a Pop-Tart over a toaster strudel? Yes. You're crazy. Yes, absolutely. Have you had a toaster strudel? I've had a toaster strudel before. Toaster strudels are too... They are... uh, They insist on themselves. You know what I mean? Pop-Tarts are like comic books or... Warner Brothers cartoons. They are colorful and they are simple and they are exactly what they say. Like Poster Strudel is like uh it's good. It's really good, but it's like I don't know. I'm also a monster and I eat Pop Tarts cold. So I, so do that. I. Mm-hmm. That there's there is a level of effort involved here. There is a level of effort involved. Maybe that's the qualifying <laughs> entry. I just feel like Toaster Strudels to me have always felt like um like I've had them before and they're good. They're like really, really good. But it's like it's a microwavable pastry. Like I don't I, you know, I don't no, know. I feel like the strudels go in the toaster. Or the to- well, you can make oh you don't, should not you microwave, microwave them. You microwave you the uh, the frosting. You don't need to you? microwave the frosting either. I'm pretty sure people microwave they the shouldn't. frosting. Here's the proper way to eat a toaster strudel. You take the toaster strudel, you put it in the toaster, pop that thing down. Let it cook. While it's cooking, you fire up your Xbox because you're about to have a Saturday morning game sesh. Then you go back when it dings. You tear open the frosting packet that you've been holding in one hand to, like, warm it up a little, just enough to be able to pour it. And then you pour that, uh, you pour the frosting on. Use your finger to wipe it around so it's across the entire pastry and then lick your finger off because that frosting's damn good. And then you go sit down and enjoy your video games. 
You use your finger to spread the frosting? Save if it saves on silverware. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would do that. I could see doing that. And for then sure. you also get the fun of licking your finger. <laughs> okay. That but makes don't sense. You s- that makes like, a lot of sense. I'm just very weird about having stuff on my hands in the kitchen. Like mm-hmm. if oh, I'm right. ever um if I'm ever baking, I wash my hands like five times during it. And I normally oh, don't fair. care like outside of that, but Ugh. I just I just uh I mean it sounds really good. It just but like I I would prefer like uh you know, like you pour you pour your Dude, like if we're gonna go out, we go all out, all out, right? Like if we're gonna make it a Saturday morning cartoon or video game day, like you get your sugary cereal, you get like Reese's Puffs or like peanut butter Captain Crunch get and Gold Grabs. Some, some, no, 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 you Cinnamon get some stuff crunch. like that. No, no, he's got a point. Uh, <laughs> I I could see Cinnamon Toast Crunch as well, but those three that I mentioned are the ones I'd go for personally. Oh, You'd go for a Golden rather... Grams over Cinnamon Toast Crunch? Yes, absolutely. I You're will. Nuts. That I will do. No, 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 no. I'm golden, New boy. York changed you, man. <laughs> no, dude, I've always loved golden grams. I, ever since I was a kid, they've been my favorite. E- probably my favorite sugary cereal, honestly. Wild. <laughs> hey, I never good. hear anybody pick golden grams. Oh, I love them. You that pour is... a bowl of those, and you get your Pop-Tarts with the box. It's right there. You maybe get, like... I don't know, some chocolate milk because we're going to be real sugary yeah, with yeah. this. And you sit down, you watch some Scooby-Doo Ooh. or you 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 boot up like uh, like a classic side scroller, the game you're working on right now, and you just fucking, you go. You just play, you know? And you have your classic Saturday morning, you know? And then at noon, you have Nothing. a fifth of whiskey <laughs> and a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> and you start the adult Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> then the childlike whimsy shatters. Yes, yes. Then you've shattered you the innocence. Drunk. Yeah, exactly. And then by the evening, and then you're in bed by ten because you had so much alcohol. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say by the then you go for the uh, then you go for the senior special at the Rose Garden at like mm-hmm. five, and you fall asleep watching BTV, and you've gone through the entire life cycle that hey, the Sphinx describes in BTV. Oedipus Rex. I'm not mocking BTV. I love BTV. Dude, I I discovered I have a channel on my uh, television here that literally it's like we have a bunch of like very random specific channels on this like television in my living room. And there's one that literally just plays Westerns. And I was like Ooh. watching some of them last night. And I was like, this is awesome. I would literally this channel is great. I would fall asleep to this when I'm an old man for sure. <laughs> nice. I, um, yeah. my, this is a bit of a tangent, but it relates to the Westerns. Um, my friends were having a bachelor party once and we all got an Airbnb together. Mm-hmm. Um, and we found a Western on MeTV and we were all just captivated by it, but like we didn't even have the audio on. <laughs> we were just like watching oh. the show, interpreting what was happening. Oh, dude, what, what was it? Do you like, I mean, I don't know what show it was. There was like this British family or something, and then this cowboy, and they were trying to cross the desert, but they did it really stupidly, or something <laughs> went wrong. Um, so they were like stuck out in the desert and they had to walk, but like this cowboy knew how to survive and he was trying to keep them alive, but they just wouldn't listen to him for whatever reason. So that tracks. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah. Just a British dad, his beautiful daughter, and then some goofball <laughs> companion, along with a cowboy. You know, pretty standard formula. I love that. Yeah, that's classic. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, that sounds like, fun. One friend was like, what is happening right now? Because I guess she wasn't paying very much attention. Um, mm-hmm. And then we all just like answered her with what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. But, oh, that's great. And tangent. Oh, I love that. Actually, screw it. I might just switch the Saturday morning cartoons out. I would just watch Western. Maybe I just watch Westerns all day, honestly. Oh, no, he's old. Yeah, you just got old. Oh, yeah, no. I did just get old. Sorry, James. We have to kick you out of kid, um, Codename Kids Next Door. He's old. Okay. <laughs> just a very no. sad thing for a 26-year-old man to say. No. <laughs> 
James, I think I think it was me who was being a sad one there. I think that's what John's referring to. Oh, oh, damn. Well, I'm sorry. You know, I mean, I like westerns, but you know what? Try to kick me out of the KND. All right, wipe my memory if you dare. You gotta get me back to that treehouse. Yeah, see what happens. (laughs) All right. Even number one, no, uh, number one's dad gets his memory back. Spoiler alert. So, but I guess he does have to go back eventually. So, never mind. Yeah, because isn't his grandpa the evil grandpa? Yeah, his grandpa, I think, is the, uh, is, is, yeah. Naughty children from down the lane were the The, team zero that got lost in on mission. The delightful children. Delightful children from down the lane. My bad, my bad. Mm -hmm. Number one's grandfather, father. No, no, that's uh, um number one's father is father. Oh, uh, okay. But his no. grandfather was evil, I thought. Number one's father is not father, because father is the father of the delightful children from down the lane. I think father is his uncle. Cause father, I think, is the one of the sons of grandfather. And Nigel's dad is the other, I think. Okay. Well, now we gotta Google some kids next door lore. Oh, man. Yeah, <laughs> Dude, I, I love that show. All I remember is that number one, they learned that aging was an Earth disease. <laughs> really? That I don't remember at all. Oh no, I remember reading about it one time that like the finale was that number one and the ki- kids next door realize that aging is a disease, and number one leaves Earth to avoid it and joins kids next door intergalactic. Like, oh, the galactic so cool. level of kids next door to go around helping keep the peace and spread awareness. <laughs> and Because, like, I think they did a bunch of, like, interview segments with the grown-up team. Like, they gave them their memories back and interviewed them as, like, so what do you remember about number one? Mm-hmm. That's, but, uh, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Anyway, talking about things we knew in the past, our next segment is Better Buddies Recommend, where we recommend a piece of media to enjoy. Who would like to start? Uh, I can go. Go for I'll it. Take the, I'll take this one. Um, so, this was last week. I, I finished reading um, the New Testament, officially. Um, I, I started months ago i think in like maybe january like january or february and i just finished it uh last week um i give it a seven out of ten uh i give its ending like a two out of ten um yeah the book of revelation is awful uh i it was my it's so far it's the my least favorite thing i've read in the entire bible um and it has amazing imagery, but it comes off as like purely psychopathic. Uh, I really do not like it. Um, There's but, a reason it's an excuse for so many cults. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, it. The fact that it was included at all in the biblical canon is somewhat distressing to me, um, and I'm trying to figure out why. But because they needed an ending. There are many better endings. There's so many no. better endings. Have you I, read the book of Revelation? Frankly, no. It sucks. But what <laughs> other sucks. end could they leave it on? They, they're like, okay, and done. That's that's it. That's the Bible. We're not telling you anything beyond this point. After that, figure it out yourself. Why do that when they could have been like, well, hey, here's what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, it's just like, I agree with that, but like... Most of the New Testament, like, I'm not going to say it's all, like, sunshine and roses and rainbows or whatever, but, like... Well, they killed Jesus in it, so... They (laughs) do, they do, but it's also still, like, there's a lot of, like, themes of, like, hope and redemption and forgiveness and being able to be better than you were the day before and blah, blah, blah. And part of that is me, obviously, just rolling in my own cultural context and kind of reading into it. But, like, for the most part, it's... It's like a, I would call it like a hopeful or somewhat positive book, but the book of Revelation like is literally like 
only 144,000 people out of the whole world are going to make it out of whatever bloodbath is going to come during the apocalypse. Uh, and most like most people will be judged. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people who are not going to make it. Some people are going to make it, but they're going to have to live through all this like garbage first. Um, I'm honestly surprised I haven't heard of a zombie apocalypse movie based on the book of Revelation. Dude, I am too, because it has, I will say, it has some of the most, easily the most vivid imagery I've found in the whole book so far. Like, the Bible is not a very descriptive text, but that book is, like, vivid. Like, almost gut-turningly so. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, I would I would give the book, I liked the New Testament. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. Uh I, a lot of good little stories and parables. I think some of my favorites are, uh, I really like the book of Hebrews, which felt like it was the most philosophical in the New Testament. Uh, I really which like that one. Uh, it's like, it's just like, uh, there's a bunch of letters in the back of the Bible. Like, cause it goes like in, in the New Testament, it goes like the gospels. And then, so it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have the Acts of the Apostles, which is basically just like... Uh, Them fucking around after Jesus. Essentially, yeah. And then you basically, like, between the <laughs> between Acts and the what end way to of put the it. Bible. I mean, Am it's I essentially... No, it you're not. <laughs> <laughs> like, Jesus um, dipped out and here's what we did. Yeah, I mean, no, it, it literally... I like to imagine, like, <clears throat> Acts basically opening with, like, all the... Because it, it kind of describes them all sitting in this upper dining area of a house, like on the second floor one morning. I just like to imagine a very quiet scene where they're all just kind of like sitting there. And then one of them is literally just like, what do we do now? Because it's like right after he died. <laughs> so they're like, well, isn't that basically what, we, what happens if what the Holy Spirit do? shows up and is like, go preach? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the Holy Spirit shows up and it's like... You get the gift of tongues, and you get the gift of tongues, and then they but run God out into the street. God destroyed the Tower of Babel and forced everybody to have different tongues because humanity cooperated too much, so don't get too big for your britches. I mean, basically, they run out into the street, and <laughs> I actually thought this part was really funny. They run out into the street, and they're basically, like, babbling. Like, they're trying to talk to people, and people are, like, weirdly entranced because even though they're, like, they're speaking words that they don't necessarily understand at the same time they do. Like it describes it as basically like somehow they're speaking their languages, even if they don't necessarily understand the words like immediately. Yeah. Um, and one of them is like, one of the apostles is basically like, you may think because of the strange way we're talking that we're drunk, but we couldn't be drunk. <laughs> we couldn't be drunk because it's only noon and who gets drunk at noon? <laughs> Sound reasoning. I just thought it was you really know? funny. <laughs> I can't find the flaw in that logic. Yeah. So anyway, I really like that one. Hebrews is though between Acts and the Book of Revelation, it's basically all letters. So oh, is that like same... Paul's letter to the Corinthians or Paul's yep. letter to the it's okay Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, the Hebrews. Uh, uh, St. Peter's letters, John wrote a letter, James wrote uh, a book of the Bible as well. Um, so it's like, it's just basically a collection of like letters and separate writings that the apostles uh, all kicked in uh, kind of for the for, for the end of the book. Um, and I thought, uh, again, Hebrews is pretty good because uh, it's very philosophical. It sounds like it was written by Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of Paul's like aren't too bad, but he's very overzealous. But anyway, I would well, suggest fair, like Paul's also a convert, like late game convert. He yeah, but one of the he, originals. Sa he sounds honestly. Sometimes he comes off as the guy who the newest guy to join the friend group who's like trying way too yeah, hard to fit that's in. What he is. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so because he was persecuting them before, and then he's like, "Oh fuck, I fucked up. I got to get right." <laughs> Yeah, he was. He was like, he was like basically like a, he was like a bounty hunter. Like he was like hunting down like, uh, Catholics there. He was, he was the Cad Bane of ancient, of ancient Israel. And he, uh, and then he, yeah, then but he did got, he have a cool hat? uh, I'd like to imagine he did. Yeah, I, I like to imagine he did <laughs> personally. 
but yeah, I mean, uh, I would I would go check it out. Uh, not a bad book. Uh, very interesting to read. Uh, we get a lot of our stories from it. And um, yeah, not too bad. Seven out of ten, even with the two out of ten ending. Cool. Uh, John, um, would you like to go next or should I? I have a comment on oh. James's thing. Go for it. Um, I took a biblical historiography class back in college. Mm -hmm. Um and there was some theory that the book of revelations was mainly code to communicate with one another in the roman empire um when they were being roman occupied but catholicism was a no-no hmm. yeah so, like the number of the beast referred to or the mark of the beast referred to something about nero yeah it's i i've heard that as well that's a that's a pretty <clears throat> excuse me that's a very common uh even even in the prelude to in the preface to the book of revelation in by king james like they even say like uh because i think nero's name something about it works out to the number like 666 like there's something gotcha. with it's like caesar augustus nero or like nero emperor nero something like that works out to that number so you're like you're correct like that's one of the interpretations is that it was basically like um it's not so much foretelling a specific event but it's basically telling christians like in the in this is that like in events such as this this is like how you should behave and this is like how you should act but like it's also very very difficult because there's just there's a lot going on in that book um but i i've heard that interpretation as well and i i think it, it's somewhat apt uh honestly gotcha and then final comment with no <gasps> book of revelation we get no nostradamus effect so i think it's an even trade oh really why <laughs> well, what what does that mean <laughs> yeah there used to be a segment there okay so history channel he used yeah. to have apocalypse week yeah that's and, right and there was a um a show during Apocalypse Week called the Nostradamus Effect. And it, it was just awesome. It was, like, not quite as crazy as Ancient Aliens, but uh, so was it definitely like getting there. So predicting the future stuff? Yeah, it was kind of okay. like taking the book of Revelation and applying it to current events. Like, mm -hmm. there's something about um, the two temples fall or something, and it's like, that's the Twin Towers! <laughs> and it was uh, uh, it was just awesome <laughs> i remember uh, they really uh they capitalized it and especially on the years leading up to uh like 2012 like that stuff really kicked into gear um yeah. but uh, i, I do remember watching that show did they do it in 2016 oh, i'm sure they did i'm sure somebody did i yeah i'm i'm i mean you have you basically have like people like Alice Jones doing that stuff yeah. right now anyway. But I feel like the History Channel made it a little more sort of like it's it the was like a little channel, which means it must be true. It's on Hulu. Is it really? <laughs> oh oh my god. <laughs> we can all watch it right now. We should all get off the podcast right now and all watch the Nostradamus okay, effect. So pause the show, go watch the Nostradamus effect, get fully inducted into conspiracy theory, then come back. Yes. Yes. I just love the book of, the like book of Rel revelations and the like way cults will pop up and be like, "Oh, we this is the end of the world based on these calculations from the book of revelation." And then like more than once the day has shown up and the world's kept going and they've been like, "Oh, we uh we miscalculated. It's actually this day." Yeah, it turns out the Mayans uh they uh, started their calendar to a different spot than we thought they did. So, uh, yeah. World's not ended today. Though. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody go home. Everybody, Everybody go, go home. home. Back we'll be to fine. work. <laughs> we got at least 25 minutes. Yeah. 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 You can still get those TPS reports in. Don't worry. And and then the world will end. Yeah, <laughs> Look, TPS we'll let you take a half day today, but you better come back in an extra for an extra hour earlier after the apocalypse, okay? You got it, boss. Aye aye, El Capitan. You're, you're gonna have to take an extra hour before, sure. earlier every day if you don't want to have to work a half day on Sunday. 
yeah the uh <laughs> your boss like just like waltz well, you know like it's the day of the apocalypse like after and you're like you're like sitting in your house and there's like blood rain there's like things like flying outside it's just like your a boss literal calls you. like a nightmare yeah it's like hey uh you coming in are you coming in and you're just like <laughs> oh no oh i'm being raptured uh oh, oh, oh no oh. <laughs> nice try i know you're not catholic oh, oh man fuck <laughs> wow all right john do you want to recommend PTO next guy. or yeah go for it <laughs> um I, sure i can i can go so I, i've recommended factorio before but this time i'm playing with mods and it's consumed my life even more nice uh, yeah. So, I I started to play through with Calvin. I was telling RJ this earlier. Um, I started to play through with Calvin of the Factorio C Block mod pack um, right before the Fourth of July holiday. Um, Calvin and I played together for about two and a half hours, and now there's about thirty hours on the save. And Calvin has not played after that first session. So, <laughs> um, you know, what are the mods? What do the mods do? So it, it's kind of like Minecraft Skyblock, um, where you leverage renewable resources to make everything in the game. Um, the difference here is that you turn seawater into everything. Uh. Um, so you the the basic start of the tool chain is you dredge some water up from the ocean, you electrolyze it into slag, and then you do various things with that slag, like crush it into stone and then crystallize ores out of the sludge um, that you make with the stone, or you, like, liquefy it with sulfuric acid, and then you just, like, get more and more complex um, processes. You get real Dr. Stone with it. Yeah, to get more efficient. Like, you get more efficient processes as you go along. But um, through that, uh, you just have to, like, keep dealing with the byproducts which is something the base game doesn't really have. Um, so it's been a very... It's it's like playing the game for the first time again, which is very nice. Very neat. Nice. So, How, do, would so recommend. you have to like, develop ways to get rid of the byproducts then? Like, oh, this process developed this product, but also this byproduct, and we can't just let it stack up. Right, if you let it stack up, everything shuts down. Uh, um, so you have to find a d way to deal with it. Thankfully, it there are... Chest. You can until you run out of space in the chest. Ah. Um, sounds like it's time to the... pollute. <laughs> huh? I said, sounds like it's time to pollute. It, it is. Factory must grow. Um, you also start off on like a really small square and you have to construct landfill as you go. Ah. So you can turn slag into crushed stone into landfill um, and just like build out your island. So. Like time is the the most critical resource because everything else is um, renewable. Ah. But yeah, I'm having fun. Um, the other thing about the byproducts is they're usually inputs to other processes, mm -hmm. so it's kind of up to you on if you want to like void things and just throw them away, or if you want to figure out how to route them to other things. That's cool. That's really cool, actually. <laughs> yeah, I like it so. A lot. Like, okay, so basically, for anyone who, because I know you've talked about Factorio before, but for anyone who, like, might not uh, know, like, it's basically, like, a more complex Minecraft, almost, isn't it? Except, does it does it actually involve you setting up your own, like, refinery, or essentially? Or what is, like, the driving mechanic of the game that separates it from other builders or crafters, like like a Minecraft, you know? So, you don't really... You don't like set up your own refinery in the mm -hmm. same way. There's like in the base game, there's like six to eight processing buildings you can use. Mm -hmm. And then it's just about how you string all those together. It is primarily a logistics management game more than like a builder. Okay. Um, I see. So you got to take your input resource, you got to pipe it through the processing tool chain, and then use the outputs for stuff. Uh, progressing along a tech tree the entire time so you unlock more toys to play with um 
and then you make the choice to either go back and refine your setup to, for making a better setup to later when you have better tech, um, just making a new thing and let the old thing run while you work on the new thing. <laughs> mm. So it's just very cool. Um, it, it really scratches the programmer brain because like you just have a bottleneck to deal with everywhere. Yeah. So uh, you're yeah, always just solving problems and getting the little dopamine hit. Yeah, you are. I mean, you are basically just setting up modules to run a certain way and then just making sure that they either improve or just don't like break down or whatever. And then the fun thing is triaging when things break. <laughs> <laughs> and like deciding cool. what to do next, like what's the highest priority thing right now. Um, so it is really quick. Is this seawater mod the only one that is in effect right now? Or are there other ones that you're running concurrently or that you would suggest to people? It's a whole mod pack. It's actually two mm -hmm. mods with a bunch of dependencies. Um, mm -hmm. So you can just download this together. This is kind of my first experience with modded and it's not quite the deep end, but it's like 75% of the way there. So um it's cool i would just use the recommended mods probably and then update as you play with anything else you're more familiar with neat but yeah that is my little love letter to factorio um oh. sexy in every couple months <laughs> i love it it does sound like a game that's very you honestly there's a Demo too, if you want to try it. Oh wink, my wink. god! Wink, wink. I convinced RJ and Calvin to play it. RJ doesn't like it very much. Calvin kind of likes it, but doesn't really feel like he knows what he's doing. My, I could. My problem is the same hand. thing I end up with in modern Minecraft, where I like, I get halfway through a thing, but I'm not efficient, and I, I'm, I, my efficiency is just so bad, and it's just mm. like I. I'd get there eventually, but why? <laughs> That's part of the learning process. I struggle with that too. And honestly, this new mod pack has been a little eye opening because, like, you can't be efficient at the mm -hmm. beginning. So that's kind of freeing. <laughs> like, nice. I can't have that expectation for myself. So <laughs> that kind of let me push through it. Ooh, so well, that sounds. Like a healthy perspective. Yeah. But Sometimes now I can go. go back yeah. and optimize stuff. <laughs> now I can fix that, everything. Yeah, I, yeah, I can fix. I will, in games yeah. like that, or like That's good, Minecraft, though. I will get things set up and working, but I will never go back and optimize because I just don't do it. So then I end up with cobbled messes and it just becomes to a point where it's like, I it's more effort to make this work than I want to put into it. Oh, that man. is... A very common experience. <laughs> they always say, uh, you know, writing is 99% rewriting. So it's it's a good skill to be able to kind of take a look at like what you've done the day before and be able to kind of, you know, look at it in a new way and see where it can, uh, it can truly go. Yeah. The, um, the Factorio community lovingly refers to that process as spaghetti. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because you use transport belts everywhere, so you have like long noodles of uh, transport belts. But it's valid. It's a valid way to play. Your factory is your own. That sounds so. Yeah, it sounds like a nice little microcosmic community, but it sounds really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? Yeah, I could gush all day about that. Like, I can gush all day about Zelda, so I'm happy to move on if you think well, this is a good segue point. I think it is, because we're not going to talk about Zelda, although I did spend two days straight playing it oh, a week and a half ago. We're going to talk about the other game I spent two days pl straight playing, and that is Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX. Okay. Okay, good. the one on the Switch? The one on the Switch. Okay. Good lord, is that an excellent throwback. Like, it's, it, it is what a game remake should be, and that it is a, re the art style is really good, but it's still, like, recognizable as, like, yep, this is, this is Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, the originals. The story is 
the same. The, uh, but the, like, quality of life changes are worth it. So worth it. You can, uh, instead of eating gummies to increase your IQ and have, like, this whole list of, like, skill things you can get, instead, there are rainbow gummies that will give you a special skill. You get the one, and you eat a new rainbow gummy to change it. But I lucked out, and, like, on the first one I ate, my main Pokemon, Mudkip, got the... Beast. He got the one that makes it more likely for a Pokemon to join your team. The more Pokemon are on your team. Okay. On top of that, they added in a thing where occasionally dungeons will have a Pokemon that has fainted on the floor. This is not a mission, it's just in addition to. And if you feed them an apple, they will be grateful and join your team. Oh, alright. Alright. So you do that once or twice. And then you can, it's more easily able to friend Pokemon. On top of that, you can bring, you can bring three into a dungeon, but you can have a total of eight in your group while you're going through the dungeon. (laughs) So you can pick up five other guys. Like, wow. When I, you have, when I say the Groudon fight was so easy, you have no idea. Because I, when I went in with three Pokemon and left with eight. Damn, my man is recruiting like Scientology <laughs> over here. Holy crap! Like the army over here. Like it's like honestly kind army. of annoying right now, just because I'm at the Rayquaza dungeon, and okay. I keep getting like I'd say a good way up it, and I can't fucking recruit anyone. <laughs> I don't know I if it's a story tough. reason or what, but it was like, God damn it. Could I just get somebody to join my team? I know some of you, because, like, you don't have to have the friend area for them to join. Yeah. They will just join your team and run the mission with you, and then, when they're done, give you money. As, like, a thanks for letting me run. I don't remember if that was in the original. Where is that in the story? Is that after you get outcasted? Uh, it is after you're found innocent. (laughs) Okay. Yes. Okay then, yeah. They, that's weird that people don't join your team. Um, I suspect it's probably just a numbers thing. Like I haven't run into any like feed this Pokemon to get them to help. Gotcha. Um, I, I just remember. I'm not gonna lie. Really quick to interject. Like, and I know that you probably haven't finished it yet, but like I do remember one of the mechanics I really didn't like as a kid. Spoiler alert. But I remember when you Spoiler finished alert Mystery for this Dungeon game from goddamn 2008 or whatever. Hey, just in oh, case. Before that. Just in case. But spoiler for it, like, when you finished it, when you complete the main story, like, you know, you could still run around and do stuff. But I remember for some reason your partner becomes nonverbal. Yeah. Like, they just you stop. Become another Pokemon, yeah. Yeah, they, and like, they just stop talking to you. And I remember for some reason as a kid that made me really sad. So I hope they don't do that again. I, I don't know I'm why they did that. Not long to find out, uh, but I do think it's kind of funny though that they do that after it's like, oh, your job in the Pokemon world is done. Go back to being a human, and you're like, no, I want to stay with my new Pokemon friends, and then you do, and then they never talk to you again. <laughs> they all yeah. abandon you. Psych. Ironic twist. <laughs> yeah. <I'm... laughs> that was good. One of the things I, um, I really want to compliment real quick is the art style, though, because it's, like, weirdly cell... Sh- it, I Cell shaded is the best, for like, word I have for it, but it's almost like they'll have the outline of the Pokemon, and then the color filling is more of, like, a color pattern, but as, like, say, Mudkip's tail wags, the pattern itself doesn't move with the line. It's like if you had a piece of colored backing paper behind it, and as you move the top paper, you saw the pattern change underneath. Oh, it's like okay. chowder. Yes. It's like how they would do stuff in chowder. <laughs> yes. But, like, it's it's technically 3D. The first chowder-like game. <laughs> yes, finally. <laughs> We're feeling that, that series influence. 
I was looking, I was watching a trailer for a little bit on this. Um, when you mentioned it, I agree that art style is like, uh, I was obviously a little disappointed immediately because it's like, it would be cool if they were just the sprites, but I also understand with the switch, like you got to take full advantage of it. I do think that art style is still pretty fun. So I think I'm glad the kids are good choice to, for that conversion. I agree. I agree. I agree. Wait, who do you, uh, who'd you end up as? Who, who'd you, who'd you get? That's one of the other nice things. Uh, okay. After you, they have the whole quiz thing. So you can just take the quiz. But afterwards, they're straight up like, are you this Pokemon, or do you think you're a different one, and give you the list? Oh. Yeah, they just let you pick. <laughs> oh. But I, I I, will say, on the quiz, I got a Machop. Oh, nice. But I chose to be a Mudkip. Well, you Fair gotta. Enough. Yeah, you gotta. You um, got to. One of the other nice things they did, too, is that they did not do... The only restriction they did on partner Pokemon was typing. So, uh, and same with, like, choosing your own Pokemon, there's no, like, in the original one, if you said you were a boy, you could not be a Skitty. And they took that away. You can be whatever fucking Pokemon you want. Out of the original that list. That is Kinda interesting. Cool. I didn't even know Look Skitty how far was... far we've come as a society. Skitty is not female only. No, I didn't even know Skitty was a choice, like Scott but in the original Misfits. You were a boy. In the original, you always chose boy. Oh. Boy. Boy. Take that, Japan, and your gender normative Pokemon distribution. <laughs> 2005 was a different time. 2005 was Ooh. a very different time. Two more years, that'll be 20 years away. Stop. Hey. We already crossed that threshold for. The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Damn. Um, it's pretty wild. Damn. Ooh, and you know God. all the games that came before that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah seriously. Mystery Dungeon DX is great. Um, one of the other nice things they added in that I don't remember being in the originals, I don't think it is. Um, if you faint, oh, when you faint in a dungeon, you can rescue yourself. You can have, like, you can set up pre-generated, like, teams of, like, these three Pokemon, or these three Pokemon, or these three Pokemon, and then if you f- lose in the dungeon, it asks, like, do you want to res- wait for rescue? You click yes, and on the main title screen, there's, like, Pelipper Post Office, and you just go there and, like, pick three Pokemon out of your team, yeah. and be like, alright, go rescue yourselves. So, that used to be link cable functionality, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you could... Helper. Oh, yeah. as, as I understood it, in the originals, you could have other people rescue you. Yeah, yeah. You can do that still, but you can also just use Pokemon from your own, like, roster. Hmm. Okay, that's pretty cool. I, I don't remember being able to do that in the original. Yeah. yeah um, I, I, should I don't remember that ASP. either. <laughs> So, like, that's been fun and helpful because there have been a couple times where I've lost and it's like, oh, let me just get my B team out there to save the day. And then in rescuing yourself, you don't have to restart. It's just like, oh, you're rescued. Start over from where you were at. I mean, well, because wasn't the old one, like, if you fainted in a dungeon, like, you had to restart, right? You lost everything. You had to restart. You emptied your I think box. that's that should be a difficulty option. I think at the very least, hmm. or or you can only use the rescue option sparingly. I still think there should be because it's like I hate to be this guy, but I still do think there should be consequences for like losing or what. Like because it makes well, the are. game feel. What happens right. if your B team loses? That is a good question. Yeah, uh, I haven't run into that. But I suspect, Dude, put them on a suicide mission. <laughs> I, think, I think that kind of is what happens. Is like It kind of becomes like a suicide squad kind of thing where it's like, all right, <laughs> you three don't matter. You just have to make it far enough to rescue my main crew. Dang. Sayonara, suckers. But yeah, it, no, was, that... it was a lot of fun. It, it's a lot of fun. Real good nostalgia trip. Worth every penny. That's... Yeah, I think that's I think that's cool that you're playing through that. That 
And again, uh, I did nothing but play that game for two days straight. Out of all yeah. the Pokemon iterations I can think of, I think that one is the one that feels like the most coherent within the pre-existing world. And that was the game that I played. Because I played like uh, like on. Pokemon Rangers. Yeah. Wow, of what all a, the Pokemon third iterations... The one where there are no humans is the one that fits the best for the pre-existing Pokemon? I think, I mean, I think so. at least in ter- I thought in terms of, like, the tone of the world, like, there was something about it that always felt very natural to me. Like, I played, like, parts of Pokemon Coliseum, X- like, I played Pokemon XD Go of Darkness, I played a bit of Pokemon Rangers, like, all that stuff. I don't mean the iterations as in the main games i just mean all the different ones that like spawn okay. off of them i, I like to I me mystery dungeon saying. yeah i think mystery dungeon fits the best but i i could the, be the vibe forgetting of something. mystery dungeon falls most in line with the vibe of the mainline pokemon games yep yeah yeah that's what i mean i can agree to that i do think mystery dungeon just got a little too weird for me though after this game or within no. the game? Uh, so. Um, so, like, I played the original Mystery Dungeon, and I played the next ones, the uh, Explorers of Time, Explorers of Darkness. Um, and af- that one I enjoyed well enough. I thought that was pretty good. But after that point, it was kind of like... Just... I-, I-, I just fell off of it after that point. And then the like, there was the one with the portals, and I was just like, eh, I don't, I don't know. I, I've never you... played one after Red Rescue Team. Really? Yeah. Well, I didn't have a 3DS for the longest time, and then I got rid of it. I mean, the sequel was only on the DS. <laughs> well, then I missed out. Yeah. What was the last? Uh, what would you say was the last Pokemon game you guys played as, like, a kid? As a kid? Yeah. Like, how would you define that? Um, Probably Pokemon... Pearl. Why? I say Pearl was the last one I played as a kid. Before RJ lost his innocence. Black and white (laughs) followed, but I was in high school at that point. I was in high school when I got black and white, and I just, I distinctly remember that because it was a birthday gift from my dad. He got both, I got both of them used, and I played through, I think I got both of them used, um, and I played through them, and I, I played them, but it was the first generation where I actually sat down and was like, I don't know if I like this. <laughs> I remember having that thought about Pokemon Black. Because it it was just really rough having an unfamiliar roster. Yeah. Um, Because, like, you you have a few games under your belt at that point. We both played Gen 3 and Gen 4, and then we're just hit with Gen 5. It's like, none of the Pokemon I know are here. (laughs) Well, and even with Gen 3, Gen 3 had both Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Ruby Sapphire Emerald. So... We really got three regions under our belt worth of Pokemon that we knew and loved. And then, like you said, you hit Gen 5 with black and white, and it's like, I don't know any of these Pokemon. And yeah. Gen like, 4 didn't really add that many new ones, and it mainly just added onto existing lines. The ones, I mean, Gen 4 the was Gen Sinnoh, 4 did add, Yeah, that was yeah. Sinnoh, and the ones they did add were great, though. Like, I loved yeah, the Marcus Ray. Um... Star Raptor, Lucario. Yeah, um, I guess they did add quite a few. Yeah, Dark Rise are pretty cool, like legendary too. They had some good legendaries in yeah. Gen Four. The thing that I threw thought... me with Five was I, and th- this is gonna make me sound like a Gen Oneer. I'm not. I just never really attached to many of the designs. Like for whatever reason, yeah. Gen Five is like my least favorite with designs. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you feel. I, I know what you're saying. I think it's just like they began to feel a little um they did start to feel like a little cartoonish. Like I don't know. I and maybe that's because like to be fair, 
like i'm a gen 3 guy personally um at least for the games like i'm i'm a gen 1 if we're talking about the original anime like all the way um although i do like the gen 3 stuff as well but i i just from the fleeting like stuff i saw like cuz there was still something i felt like about gen 4 that even though it felt very new it still felt like they were kind of like tethered to a basic principle right it's like we're we're going to take an animal or an object and we're going to kind of like we'll just change basically it up a little. <laughs> yeah we're going to mix it with something but like i think maybe i just remember thinking that a lot of the gen 5 stuff seemed very anthropomorphic or like cartoonish well, you I know mean- um one of the factors i don't i don't know it's necessarily good or bad but one of the things with the gen 5 designs was because it was entirely new it seemed like they were trying to redo generation one in a way when it came to the designs like a reboot yeah because like in gen one you had hitmonlee and hitmonchan in gen five you had sock and throw in Gen 1, you had the Polywag line, and in Gen uh, 5, you had the Time Pole line. Mm. Like, yeah, that's fair. And it's, it's not a one-to-one perfectly, but there are a number of designs that came out in Gen 5 where it was kind of like, this feels like you're trying to reboot this Pokemon from Gen 1, and I'd rather just have that Pokemon. Yeah, like a lot of these, like I'm just looking at a Gen 5 list right now, like in order of their stuff. And like, uh, I guess um, you got the three starters, which I actually like the three starters. Those aren't too bad. Um, But then you've got like, uh, uh, hold on here. I mean, you've got stuff that looks like um, a lot like, oh, my God, I'm going to be so bad with some of these names. What was the um? What was like the purple monkey uh one with the hand on its tail? A-bomb. Do you guys remember that? I love a bomb. A bomb. Yeah, you got like some of these like primate ones look basically just like variations of a bomb mixed with like mine and plusel. You got ones that look a lot that are basically just like Pidgey or like a uh, Pidov. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like Pidov. You've got. I've seen one called Blitzel and Zubstrika. I don't know how to say some of these. They're they're good, but they kind of remind me a lot of like Hound Doom. Honestly, their design is somewhat evocative of it, even though they're like equine instead of canine. Um, rock and roll, like this stuff reminds me a lot of uh, Geo Dude Grappler and Yep. Gigalith say, is definitely different. Oh wait, um, it, it like reminds the, me of like Beldum. Like, yes, Metang and Metagross line. Yeah, that's yeah. Funny. And then like Wubat, Swubat feels like Zubat and Crobat. I mean, um, Wubat literally sounds like Zubat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I can see what you're saying where they, like, uh, they're, it feels like they're just trying to do a, uh, a lot of... I did love the Golurk line. What is Golurk? It, it's, a big... it's the mech Pokemon. <laughs> it's a big ghost robot. <laughs> Is there an evolution into that? I thought that was just like on its own. No, it's a two-step evolution. Oh, it's the Golet to Golurk. Yeah. Okay. It's like a little robot. It like... becomes a big robot. Some of these are kind of cool. I like Arkin and Archeops. Like that's kind of neat. That's a that's like something they haven't done before. But um, yeah, Gen Five is when I is the one I think I was no longer a kid. Why the hell do they have like a goth girl Pokemon? <laughs> What the hell? It's literally Goth, Gothita, Goth Gotharita, Gothatel. Yeah, <laughs> that's fascinating. Um, but I liked Gen Six. I really caught. On, I I don't think a lot of people liked Gen Six, but I was okay with it. That was X and Y, right? Yeah, I had a lot of fun with Y. Same. Like I liked the legendary designs. I liked the starter designs. Uh. Um, oh shit, now I can't think of the name, but the grass starter from X and Y I thought was great. Ch- Chestnut. I love Chestnut. Chest- yeah. Chespin. Oh, and Chestnut was the final evolution. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Grin Ninja is a pretty good, like, uh, design. I don't really know him, obviously, from Smash Bros, but 
these feel these feel a little bit more sort of i think i think honestly uh rj i think you were right like I think rather than trying to reboot um, the actual games, what they were trying to do, and I apologize if you kind of said this in so many words, but I think more that what they were trying to do is they were trying to reboot the style of of it because I think they may have realized that they couldn't continue doing the style they had because it was not fit for 3D models. So they probably had to find a way to introduce that. That's a... That's a little bit of contention when it came to the, um, I want to say it was XY, and not XY, sorry, mm-hmm. the Sun and Moon. With Sun and Moon, they redid all Pokemon models to be 3D models. And when they did it, they were like, oh, we're redoing them all as three individual 3D models so that it's easier to port them from game, port Pokemon from game to game. And the very next generation, uh, which was Sword and Shield, they said, oh, we're not doing full national decks anymore. And a lot of people were like, what the fuck? You just did all this work to 3D model everybody so it would be easier on you to port them over. Uh, By full national decks, he means you can't get every Pokemon. There's only like a, a subset that are available in the games. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Dang, dude, that kind of sucks a little bit. I mean, I guess it makes sense. I, I guess it makes sense. There's they, over a thousand gonna... Pokemon now with Scarlet and Violet, so... Is there yeah. any sort of national decks in Sword and Shield, or is it all regional? Um, there is a national decks, but I don't remember how expansive it is. Okay, I beat the champion and put the game down. It took my got to the champion set the game down for like a year and then beat the champion and put the game down again so yeah i have to go back and finish scarlet and violet shit although something that's interesting is as i was playing through sword and shield i got pretty excited for gen 5 pokemon when they showed up it's like oh i know what that is (laughs) (laughs) i like that one (laughs) so i guess it worked in hindsight it was a little um a little shocking to my 12-year-old brain at the time or whenever I played it. Um, but, you know. I remember Black and wh- I remember Black and White also just being hard. Like, compared to other Pokemon games, if that makes sense. I think they might be the hardest Nuzlocke's, too. That sounds right. I don't know. Um, Nuzlocke... Ugh. Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are the hardest. Oh. Um, mainly due to totem battles. Black and white through black and white is the third hardest, and black two and white two is the second hardest. Here so yeah, they they were hard. <laughs> oh, Gen three had some awesome designs. Oh my god, getting flashbacks. Fucking routes. Damn. Slack off. Shroomish. Well, Duskull. Sableye. Haze of nostalgia. I think we've run out of time for this week. <laughs> I think we have. God bless Pokemon. Did you know it's the uh, it's the highest grossing media franchise currently, like of all time. Yeah. Damn. Mainly due to plushies. Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, yes. having recently seen some Pokemon stores in Japan. It makes sense. You you understand why now. No, I get, I get it. it. I get it now. I went to three of them, and they all had people. <laughs> and that's that one mean? city. Just like me, my girlfriend, and her 500 pound or $500 Marie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I really do want that Snorlax beanbag, though. I do, too. Oh, my God. I want that huge pillow. I want to hug it so bad. All right. Thank you both for joining this week. Thank you for having us. Thank you all. Thank you to the band Problem of Interest for letting us use the song Living in the Moment off the album Cross Off Yesterday. You can find them on iTunes and Spotify. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. We're also on social media. Our Facebook is Better Buddies, where we have our Meme Mondays. 
Our Twitter is at BetterBudCast. Use the hashtag BetterBuddies when you tweet about the show. And our Gmail account is BetterBuddiesCast at gmail.com. You can send us fan art, hate art, fan mail, hate mail, declarations of love and or war, icebreakers you want us to answer, questions you need advice on, or story ideas you want us to flesh out. And last but not least, be a better buddy. Hell Gundam sounds disgusting, by the way. That sounds like some yeah. kind of disease. Yep. Like gangrene. Oh. Toes. Oh. I mean, at least two <laughs> in, in <laughs> any <laughs> Voltron, at least two people are the toes. <laughs> well, they're the legs, right? Or whatever. It's not that. I mean, yeah, but uh, it's weirder it's to call them the toes. <laughs> they are feet, leg, and half an ass each. I want to be the feet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't don't let him be the feet. Times Mecca. I want to be the feet. So bad. Do we have any other recruits for the Voltron program besides this guy? Be the feet. We already have two feet. (laughs) We. I don't. What if What if we put you on arm, like left arm? Feet. Mm. Left arm is great. You can punch people. I'll be the feet. (laughs) <laughs> okay, I'll be the feet. Yeah. Okay, I get. No, guys. I read you loud and clear. No. I will be the feet. Nope. I don't no, think I, I don't think I, you're hearing me. I'm picking up exactly what you're putting. You're down. gonna be left feet arm, and you're way. gonna be the chest. I totally agree. I will be both of the feet. I get to put them in my oh, mouth can't... before I start. No, right? hang on. Even if okay. you're gonna be, if, cool. if, if, okay, if you were gonna be one of the feet, you can only be one of the feet. You can't be both. Oh, all right. And you're but I, get, I do get to put both of them in my mouth, right? No. Sir, this is a hundred plus foot okay, tall robot. Okay, just one of them you, in it, my they mouth. They don't fit in your mouth. All right. Please don't lick, well, the, d- please don't lick the robot. I, I, okay, understood. Lick carefully because it's electric. N- no. That's smart. That's no. good. I like oogie, that. Oogie, oogie. Right. I don't. Oogie, oogie, oogie. oogie. <laughs> Is this guy actually the most a part of our army? Sexually like, arousing uh, song. How did he get in here? It's electric. It's electric. Like a condom's toes. Yeah, he's been <laughs> uh, he's been alone. <laughs> he's been alone with the Gundam's feet for two hours now. All we hear is slurping it's sounds. sounds. It's electric and slurping sounds. <laughs> Muffled behind the blast doors. I don't I mean what are we supposed to do here? The sound oh, of fucking... tungsten plate being scraped by a human tongue. It's electric. <laughs> electric. God, uh, <laughs> well, I know what we're doing for rewrite this episode. Ah, uh, yes. Voltron, but they're all foot fetishists. <laughs> I want to be the foot. No, I don't want to be the I think I'm the most qualified to actually be the foot, actually. What's, okay, we each get to be a episode? toe. Uh, yeah. <laughs>